record to the cloud. Okay, uh, shalom friends, and welcome to an exciting Chabura public shiur. Today we have the privilege of having with us JJ Kimchi in his first installment of his two-part series on Shadal. Uh, for those who are new to the Chabura, welcome. A little about us, the Chabura is a physical and virtual Bet Midrash with hundreds of members from around the world. Um, I'm actually from Miami, where for the sake of getting you all jealous, I just got back from the beach. And uh, we at the Chabura strive to know God by embracing the world through the lens of Torah. We draw inspiration from the classical Sephardi approach to Torah and the many Chachamim within it, who saw no contradiction between the Torah and God's world. Other than fascinating public and members shiurim, we have an active online and physical network, a journal, get-togethers, and a publishing house. I highly recommend all to join this wonderful initiative. Uh, with that said, a little bit about our speaker. Uh, JJ Kimche is a PhD candidate in the field of modern religious philosophy at Harvard University and currently serves as the Orthodox ed educator at MIT Hillel. Uh, he received his undergraduate education at Shalem College, Jerusalem, where he double majored in Western philosophy and Jewish thought. He studied at Yeshivat Har Etzion for two years and completed his military service in the IDF's Paratrooper Brigade. His academic essays and translations have been published in both academic and popular venues. Uh, JJ is also the son of the beloved Rabbi Dr. Alan Kimche. And uh, today is also special as uh, soon to be Dr. Kimche is already a member of the Chabura. So it is always incredible when our members join on as teachers. Um, as usual, all our classes are recorded and will be available on our website after. If you have any questions, please raise your hand or post in the chat box. And please, God, there will also be time for questions at the end. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, JJ, it is a privilege and honor, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ohad. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, good evening to everyone who is here, everyone who's watching. Uh, it is a pleasure uh, to be here again. Um, thank you also to the Chabura in general for uh, for hosting me. I have to extend uh, tremendous congratulations to Sina and to the rest of uh, the Chabura crew for really creating something quite extraordinary. On everything you've done, it's uh, it's quite an achievement to create an international Beit Midrash uh, especially in a pandemic climate. Um, I'm very excited for the upcoming, uh, this mini two-part series, the lecture today and uh, on the following Sunday, uh, in which we'll be discussing a great Jewish mind in an era filled with other great Jewish minds. The mid-19th uh, century was a period, as we shall soon see, uh, which very much succeeded um, in creating some of the great Jewish minds whose works and whose ideas have resounded to this day. Um, before I begin uh, the actual class, a couple of uh, words of warning. A couple of weeks ago, when my father, Rabbi Alan Kimpri, was a was a speaker here, so he introduced his uh, class on Rav Hirsch by saying, "Well, we want to study Rav Shimon and Rafael Hirsch not because we are academic historians." And I was sort of sitting in the digital audience, thinking, uh, "Well, some of us are academic historians, and that is in fact how we approach things." Um, so the, what I will say is, we'll be very much um, in sort of an academic spirit in the sense that I'll present Shadal, uh, his biography, his philosophy, and uh, next week his. Work works on Parashanut, his works on uh, biblical commentary. And I'm not trying to convince anyone to, to sort of sign up to Shadal's ideas. Some people very much identify with him. Some people very much don't. Uh, but uh, all I want to try and convince you all is that he is an important voice and ought to be part of the conversation when we consider uh, modern Jewish intellectual history. Um, I will also warn you slightly that I tend to teach fairly quickly um, and talk fairly quickly. This is because I'm sure those of us who are you know, under the age of 30 or so uh, in the audience will identify. Um, I It's been years since I listened to anything in uh, one point zero speed. Um, this, these days, everything on YouTube and everything everywhere else is always on 1.52 speed, something like that. So um, I try and speak in a kind of manner that won't bore uh, the various audience live who are used to hearing things uh, much more quickly. Um, so with that said, I'm going to be starting my uh, my slideshow. That's generally how I like to illustrate uh, my points. So I'm going to be sharing the screen for, for one moment. And, um, and yes, hold on. Um, Okay, can everyone see the slideshow as is? Yes, excellent, fine. So today we will discuss, be discussing one of the great uh, Jewish minds of the 19th century, Shmuel David Lutzato, known by his preferred acronym, Shadal. Um, his years were 1800 to 1865. These are great um, years, um, uh, in my opinion, especially they're very easy to remember. He was born precisely at the turn of the 19th century. At the age of 65, when the time came to retire, he took a well-earned retirement um, and left this world. This uh, lecture will be focusing on uh, the biography and philosophy. I hope to spend about uh, you know half to two thirds of our time um, just sort of outlining uh, this lecture, and then we'll have time hopefully for discussion and questions at the end. So to set the scene a little bit, let's talk a bit about 19th century Jewish intellectual life. The middle decades of the 19th century between the 1840s and the 1860s were some of the best 
times to be a Jewish intellectual, to be a, a, you know, a rabbinic or um, or other kind of thinker, uh, because it was really a time when Jewish minds had finally got together and were producing the kind of scholarship that was influencing each other and would create the Jewish world as we know it today. Um, specifically, what I'm referring to is that for the first time, the mid 19th century was the creation of the Jewish Republic of Letters. Uh, the Republic of Letters, very briefly, is a term generally associated with Enlightenment studies, so the mid to late 18th century. And what you had was um, throughout sort of the Western world, you had significant um, figures significant thinkers and scholars of the Enlightenment period, um, you know, for example, in England, you had uh, Hume and Smith and, and Samuel Johnson, and in America, you had Thomas Paine and, and Jefferson and Franklin, and you had in Germany, uh, Goethe and, and Kant and, um, and Lessing and others, and of course, all the French philosophers, and essentially, they were all writing to each other, they were writing books, they were writing letters, they were writing pamphlets, they were writing book reviews, and it was this creative um, cross-pollination of ideas that were being read by everyone and being written in um, for everyone that allowed for the creation of the Enlightenment, which, which was something considerably greater and considerably more than, let's say, the Renaissance or, or other earlier intellectual um, <clears throat> movements and allowed really for the creation of the world we have it today. So in this time, the 1840s, 50s and 60s, you had Jewish, uh, important Jewish thinkers of the time creating this critical mass of books, of journals, of pamphlets, of letters, of the discoveries of new manuscripts, etc., which really allowed for um, a, a creation of an entirely new intellectual atmosphere with within the Jewish public square. Um, so I'm gonna name a few of, of sort of the major participants. This incidentally was also a time, this is very important to know, note that this was a time of the great um, crystallization or concretization of denominations within Judaism. So up until this point, you didn't really have what we know today of as say conservative Judaism, reform Judaism, Orthodox Judaism, all of these different sects and these um, sort of self identified denominations, they really coalesce, and I'll explain a little bit more about that in a moment, um, during this period. So. The first element of this period can be seen uh, in what is known as the Wissenschaft der Judentum scholars, right? So I've added a few names uh, for illustration's sake. The Wissenschaft der Judentum was a, um, an intellectual stream in which, whose protagonists believed that Judaism can and must be um, studied as an academic discipline, right? The, the German word Wissenschaft means essentially an academic science or an academic study. And it essentially was the idea that the Jewish history and, and Jewish texts and the Jewish um, culture essentially could be studied with the same tools and with the same efficacy as um, history and, and other elements of culture was being studied, you know, in the universities around Europe. This is a stream that took off really in the 1820s, but grew in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s. That was more or less its heyday uh, within Central and Western Europe. You also had the early reformists, right? So you had men like uh, Abraham Geiger and Formstedt and Holtheim and others who were using their formidable scholarship to um, to argue for a reformation of central Jewish ideas. Um, and again, they were producing their own books, they were producing their own uh, ideas and pamphlets. You had the counter reaction to reforms. You had what was known as the historical positivists, um, otherwise known as um, which eventually morphed into conservative Judaism. So you had uh, Zacharias Frankel and his sort of court historian Heinrich Gretz, who produced, uh, you know, the famous 11 volume history of the Jews, which is probably the greatest uh, Jewish intellectual achievement of the 19th century. And what you had was, again, um, they they were writing very much in opposition to the excesses, what they saw as the excesses of Reform Judaism. And of course, you had the orthodox version of that as well. So you had men like Shishra Fahl, Hirsch, Nazareel, Hildesheimer, and they were also writing um, against both the early reformists and, and, and the historical positivists. So you had, um, just to give you an example, uh, the fourth volume, I believe, of, of Gretz's History of the Jews, which included his work on the Talmud, his analysis of the, uh, analysis of the Talmud. Um, so he published that book. And a year later, Rav Shimshon Rafal Hirsch, uh, over here, one of the orthodox opponents to reform, published a 200-page book review. It was a book review almost the size of the book itself, again, criticizing the work of Gretz. So you had all of these uh, various figures, and finally, you had the, mus the late masculine of the Eastern of Eastern Europe, so those living in Galicia, uh, in Prague, and others, Nachman Krochmal, Shlomo Huda Rappaport, these are important um, figures of the time, and essentially, the reason I brought all of these figures uh, to your attention is to show that here in the 1840s, 50s, and 60s, you had this extraordinary, again, republic of letters, this exchange of ideas which allowed for the, the um, I would say, an intellectual revolution within the Jewish world, which again has resounded to this day. The figure that we will be discussing today was in many ways one of the most uh, important figures of this new uh, uh, sort of in intellectual revolution, a man called Shmuel David Lutato, Shadal. And I put here that he was both at the periphery and the epicenter of this 19th century revolution. What I mean by that is geographically, he was at the periphery, right? He lived in Italy, in northeastern corners of Italy, uh, somewhat removed from uh, the other geographical centers like Berlin, like Königsberg um, of, of the Wissenschaft der Judentum movement. Um, and also somewhat ideologically, he's also, um, 
quite dissimilar to most of the other figures, and we'll, we'll talk about that soon. But also, but on the other hand, he's also the epicenter of this, right? In other words, the works of Shadal, uh, his voluminous scholarship, his extraordinary contribution to Hebrew letters uh, and, and to Jewish uh, intellectual life in general, put him right at the epicenter of this uh, 19th century Jewish intellectual life. And therefore, that's where he, um, that's where we should place him. Uh, historically, this is the background that I want everyone to have in mind. Um, next, we're going to go through Shadal's very tragic life. Uh, you know, we read when Yaakov, uh, Yaakov you know, comes before Paro and says, uh, my, my life has been short and bitter. Um, this could quite eat well characterize Shadal's life as well, uh, unfortunately. So he was born in 1800, uh, born in Trieste, which is a free uh, port city in the northeastern corner of Italy. Uh, was then, this is obviously before the Italian state uh, came to being. Um, he uh, He's a very precocious child. Uh, by the age of 13, he describes himself as already, you know, having done short translations of things from Italian uh, into Hebrew uh, and, and other, and also he was reading Greek by then. He was also working on grammar. Grammar was something which um, sort of took Shadal's attention throughout his young, throughout his entire life, really. Um, he was very well versed in all of Torah and enlightenment literature. So he was, um, you know, he was um, studying not only the entire gamut of uh, Jewish religious literature, but also many of the Enlightenment figures like Rousseau and Condillac and Locke and Kant. These are figures who figure uh, throughout Shadal's writing throughout his entire life. Uh, the first tragedy hit him in the, in the year 1814, in which his mother passed away. Um, there is actually a crazy story connected with his mother's passing, and I will, um, you know, uh, I'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, but this is certainly the first time that Shadal really uh, saw um, sort of tragedy first uh, first hand in his life. Um, during uh, his young life, he was going to start a lifelong correspondence with two very important uh, two very important other figures. One is uh, Shmuel Chaim Lolly, who was um, a relative of his, and also uh, Yish, uh, um, Yitzhak Shmuel Regio otherwise known as Yashar of Gorizia. Uh, and the, his, Shadal's intellectual growth is very much marked by his correspondence with these two other um, scholars and grows throughout the upcoming decades. He marries uh, Bilha Batsheva uh, and has several children with her. Um, in 1829, he begins his one and only job essentially throughout his entire career, which is to teach at the Rabbinical College of Padua. Now this Rabbinical College cannot be judged to be a tremendous success. Um, in the entire, in all the years that Shadal taught there, I believe they matriculated 26 students. So 26 rabbis uh, came from that particular uh, Rabbinical College. I'm sure you can agree that is not a fantastic uh, record for a, a Rabbinical school that had, you know, that was uh, working for decades. He had many other students. He taught privately on the side and he taught in all sorts of other contexts and had many correspondence, but, um, he taught the, this tiny rabbinical college, and therefore he really did remain poor his entire life. He writes a lot about this, also because he spent a lot of his money just collating and collecting manuscripts, which he would later on um, give to other scholars across Europe. Um, in 1841, his wife, after a long bout of uh, uh, oppression, uh, depression, rather, dies. Uh, he marries his sister Leah. For those who are uh, particularly attuned to the books of Breshit, will note the irony of marrying Bilha first and then marrying Leah. Um, that's interesting in and of itself. Um, during his own life, unfortunately, Unfortunately, four of his children passed away. And this is um, something that obviously uh, was, was something that, that you know, caused a tremendous sadness throughout his life. In 1832, his, his one-year-old child died. In 1849, a seven-year-old child. In 1851, his 18-year-old daughter. And finally, in 1854, his oldest son, Filoseno, um, was, uh, died at the age of 24. Um, and that, that particular, that last death was a tragedy that sat uh, with Shadal for the rest of his life. He never really got over it. And he writes, you know, at length of his tremendous sadness and depression following the death of his oldest son, who was apparently a very, um, a prodigious and very impressive young scholar of ancient languages. Um, and I'll get a little bit more to, to him later on. Um, in 1850, he got, lost the use of one eye. And, and I'll ask you all to imagine this, that you know, someone whose entire career depends on reading texts and reading manuscripts um, and, and decoding them and a life of scholarship and writing, uh, to lose the use of one eye is really something quite, uh, uh, you know, can't really be replaced. And he essentially went blind about 10 years later. And in 1865, he dies in Padua, um, where he spent most of his life, on on uh, on uh, Erev Yom Kippur, the, the evening of Yom Kippur. So this is in one uh, in one short uh, timeline Shadal's life. As you can see, it is very much a life of tragedy, and he perceived it that way as well. He wrote of himself as someone who was very poor, constantly besailed by uh, by ailments, constantly cheated out of his money, and constantly losing those who were closest to him. However, I, I specifically wanted to place it in this context because I want to juxtapose it to Shadal's triumphant life of letters, his triumphant life of scholarship, because he really was one of the most extraordinary Jewish minds of the 19th century and very much a productive mind and someone whose creativity was vast uh, and variegated. So 
He wrote hundreds of essays, dozens of books, poems, letters, any kind of literary um, achievement within a Jewish context, one can imagine Shadal certainly achieved it. Um, he was a very uh, important, he was a very prominent linguist. He produced scholarship in multiple languages and also read several other ancient languages. He also read Arabic. He also uh, read uh, obviously uh, different forms of Aramaic and Syriac. And he's a really, really accomplished uh, linguist as well. Uh, one of the great uh, Wissenschaftler Judentum scholars, in other words, he very much um, uh, participated and contributed to this uh, new a revolution or new practice of Jewish scholarship. However, he was very critical of many of the other practitioners due to their soulless scholarship. He really, unlike some of the other uh, very Germanic, very academic minds within the Wissenschaft Judentum um, movement, Shadal was very much, uh, he very much tied his scholarship to his own religious growth and his own feelings and his own um, you know, emotional and spiritual life. And therefore it was very, he wasn't this kind of uh, detached academic shot in the library. On the contrary, um, his life of scholarship very much interacted with his, um, with his personal life. And we're gonna see that uh, shortly as, we go, as we're gonna go along. Um, and interestingly, he supplied scholarship and manuscripts to Jewish scholars all over Europe, including, interestingly, those scholars who he didn't like. In other words, uh, he was, for example, uh, he excoriated various scholars of the early reform um, movement, so Abraham Geiger and Holtheim and others. However, we have letters of, for example, Geiger writing to Shadal requesting certain manuscripts for his own scholarship, and Shadal, who possessed these manuscripts, sending them to, uh, to Geiger, and he wrote to Tzun's um, um, later on wrote, you've judged me correctly. If the Satan came to me with a request for a manuscript to publish in hell, I would kiss his hands and fulfill his every wish. This was Shadal very much, uh, you know, very generous, very um, invested in the overall advancement of Jewish scholarship, um, and that uh, sort of manifested itself within his um, generosity to fellow scholars. A very brief and partial list of Shadal's publications. So uh, Torah Hanidreshet was uh, was a work that he wrote at the age of 18, synthesizing Torah and essentially enlightenment or Kantian logic. Um, just for comparison's sake, I believe at the age of 18, I had mastered the uh, topspin backhand in table tennis. So that, that's the sort of thing I was involved in at the age of 18. Shadal was writing works, synthesizing um, um, synthesizing the, the entire Torah and, and the logic of his time. Um, Hamish Tadel, this was his early Torah commentary that he wrote and which was greatly expanded by his students after his death. Uh, we're going to talk about that a lot next week. Um, just to note, Shadal was very proud of his acronym, Shadal, which is an Aramaic verb meaning to swing or to, or to entice or to speak enticingly. And the word ham, uh, mishtadel is of course the reflexive of this. And it means he who tries, he who strives. And, and, and Shadal was very, you know, very much used that and used that as a pun and, and in various of his writings um, and referred to himself often in the third person. Um, so this was his Torah, work of Torah commentary. He wrote a work called Ohev Ger, uh, which literally means the lover of the Ger, of, of the stranger. This is a treatise on Targum Onkelos. Onkelos the Targum be, being an early translation of the Torah into Aramaic, which the Talmud attributes to, um, to the works of Onkelos, um, who was uh, supposedly a ger, a, a convert, a proselyte into Judaism. Interestingly, um, Shadal was so proud of this book, Ohev Ger, that he actually named his oldest son after it. We came across Filoseno. Filoseno is simply the Italian translation of Ohev Ger, the lover of the stranger. Philo, of course, meaning to love something, and Seno, as in you know, xenophobia, you know, the stranger. So Philo Seno, Ohev Ger, um, and this was, you know, it says a lot about Shadal that uh, you know he named one of his uh, one of his books. He named one of his children after one of his early books. Um, he wrote a translation and commentary, a very important one actually on the Chumash. He translated the, the, the Chumash into Italian and wrote various translations and commentaries on various other books of the Tanakh. Um, he also translated and introduced the Sidur and the Machzor into Italian. Again, he led this kind of um, renaissance of interest in Jewish texts within, uh, within the Italian context. Um, he wrote many books on Hebrew grammar. Shadal has been uh, noted by uh, you know, later scholars as really one of the, probably the senior grammarian of the 19th century. Um, in terms of Hebrew grammar, and as we'll see next week, a lot of his Torah commentary is based on his expertise in uh, in Hebrew grammar, and of course in the other languages as well. Um, we have a collection, a nine-part collection of Shadal's letters, Igrot Shadal, uh, that we have. He also published the Divan of Rabbi Huda Halevi. Divan is, I believe, an Arabic word meaning a collection of poetry. Um, and again, this was this shows Shadal's um, not only aesthetic but also ideological identification with Rabbi Huda Halevi, which is you know, a, a very important point which we'll return to later on. But again, Shadal saw fit to publish these, to vowelize them, to annotate them, to introduce them. Um, he wrote his own poetry, a two, a two book work of poetry. And he wrote a very important work called Vikuach al-Chokhmata Kabbalah, which I will get to later on, because I really believe that that book is 
really shows Shadal um, at his best and also exemplifies many of the intellectual um, battles going on within Shadal's mind. So this is Shadal's triumphant scholarship, again, on one page. And um, this is, of course, only a partial list, but, um, but I wanted to put it specifically after his life so we can all get a sense that he had this, this very much this tragic life, but also this triumphant scholarship, um, which, uh, which he achieved despite uh, difficulties in his life. So I'm going to go a little bit after Shadal's philosophical journey um, and, and describe as he progressed himself through his life, even though, of course, this is only a very a superficial kind of presentation, but nonetheless, it's important to get a measure of the man in this way. So in his youth, he, uh, he was a rationalist and an optimist. Uh, he was a, one, what, what one might call a late maskil. Uh, the Haskalah was the Jewish version of the Enlightenment, more or less, that took place within a Germanic context in the, seven, uh, in the 1770s, 1780s, and, and the late 17, uh, basically the late 18th century. Um, and had more or less ground to a halt by the end of the 18th century. But Shadal was a sort of late iteration of this. Um, and he saw in his early life, in his 20s, uh, again, before all the tragedies had sort of crashed on him and in his life, um, as uh, Torah and wisdom as being mutually beneficial. And he has this, this following quote, praise be unto the God of truth who has led me to the path of truth to interpret his holy words in agreement with reason and science in order to know, teach, and internalize that the Torah and reason are two great lights. This is uh, Shnei Ma'orata, a reference to, to the first chapter of Genesis, that God has given to mankind in order to illuminate the good way. May God place me in the company of those who learn wisdom by the light of Torah, and who learn Torah by the light of wisdom. And this is the in Hebrew, I couldn't resist. Um, actually, I remember when, when Sina and, and his merry men began the Chabura a bunch of months ago, I actually proposed this line by Shadal as, as sort of the tagline, a possible tagline of, of the Chabura, because I really believe that... Um, that it uh, exemplifies what what this organization wants to do, and also it uh, it is very much typical of Shadal's early youthful rationalism, and again a very fundamentally optimistic worldview that says, okay, this new Enlightenment science that's coming out of uh, Western Europe can be synthesized, can be. Um, brought into productive and fruitful conversation with the timeless values of the Torah. And that was Shadal, um, I would say, probably up until the age of 30 or so, until his early to mid-30s. However, by the mid-1830s, he had turned against his rationalism. He, he, became, he came to believe that actually Judaism and what one might call Western uh, knowledge, Western wisdom, were completely distinct. And not only that, there was a sharp antagonism between the two. And here is a classic uh, quote which explains this, uh, where he says that, um, the civilizations of the world today is a product of two dissimilar elements, Atticism and Judaism. Atticism is, is the, Greek, uh, the Greek heritage. To Athens, we owe philosophy, the arts, the sciences, the development of the intellect, order, love of beauty and grandeur, intellectual uh, and studied morality. To Judaism, we owe religion, the morality which springs from the heart and from selflessness and love of good. Atticism is progressive, for the intellect is capable of continuous development and of ever new discoveries. Judaism is stationary. Its teachings are immutable. Atticism, being progressive, takes on ever new forms through which it pleases, charms, and attracts. Judaism, ever immutable, appears older and uglier every day. Consequently, it bores, displeases, and, re and repels. However, uh, sorry, hence the apparent dominance of triumph of the former over the latter. Yet there is in human nature an inextinguishable need for the good. Beauty and grandeur cannot take the place of the good. Society needs emotion, but intellect and asceticism, far from inspiring emotion, weakens it and snuffs it out. This is why human nature reacts and always will react in the favor of the heart of good of Judaism. So again, he sees this, and he's, he's certainly not the first one to see this. This is all this, this rich uh, historical literature of Athens versus Jerusalem. But Shadal, during his mid thirties, um, very much adopted this approach in which there was a sharp distinction where Greece gave us all the values of the intellect, of philosophy, of the aesthetic values of the world. Whereas um, what you have on the Jewish side is rather the the, the, um, the pursuit of the good, but more than that, the pursuit of the good and 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 morality. In other words, that for him, and we'll see this in a moment. Um, Judaism is in favor of the heart of good. And for, Juda for Shadal, the bottom of Judaism isn't some kind of intellectual achievement, rather it is ethics. Judaism is geared towards teaching people how to live a good life in and among their fellow human beings, in and among society. And that was for him diametrically opposed to the kind of philosophical worldview um, of, of the Greeks. This is brought into even sharper contrast um, where he attacks and Shadal 
did this very often. He was very much a polemicist in addition to his other qualities. He attacks Maimonides and the Maimonidean worldview. Maimonidean and rationalistic medieval worldview was, uh, um, you know, was based on this notion that Judaism, uh, the highest form of religion is intellectual achievement, is, is understanding of basic theological truths. And that's the highest way to connect with God, to, to know um, first philosophical truths and theological truths. And for Shadal, th this could not be so, right? So he, he said the following, with a strong hand, God has separated me from those who have erred, who believe in their own power and devices, who say we were created to perfect our intellect. The greater one's intelligence, the more praiseworthy he is. God's care for man is in proportion to his intellect and determines the extent of divine providence. This is essentially a paraphrase of, um, of the third uh, uh, part of Ramam's Morin of Uchim. And this really is the Maimonidean rationalist worldview, which is that the more one develops one's intellect, the higher one's religious and spiritual achievements are. They are in fact identical uh, to one another. Of course, in the Maimonidean worldview, there was a space for ethics and there was a place, but putting that to one side, for him, the very highest um, um, achievement was intellectual. Shadal couldn't, uh, couldn't stomach that, he couldn't believe that this is anything, you know, this really, um, this really sums up the, the Torah and the Jewish worldview. Um, he says, we have inherited this type of human wisdom from the Greeks, and I term it atticism. And listen to this. Were it not for the hardships that have come my way, perhaps I too would have been drawn to this. However, my travails have taught me that man's wisdom is not, and that complete trust in our intelligence for success is unfounded. Nothing can help us apart from the joy that is performing acts of goodness, kindness, and love. Nothing can deprive us of this. I realize that the Torah's main purpose is to fortify the sense of compassion, chemla, and love in a man's heart, to trust in divine providence, which is related to man's charitableness, kindness, and integrity rather than intellect. This is crucially important, especially this second to last paragraph, which says, my travails have taught me that man's wisdom is not, etc., because this really is the bitter cry of the disappointed intellectual. And this is one of the reasons I love Shadal's work so much, is that you really see a sort of concordance between his, bio his, his biographical trajectory and his intellectual trajectory. As Shadal matures, as more and more tragedies begin to pile up in his life, he realizes, he comes to this realization that actually intelligence and intellectual achievement doesn't, doesn't help. It doesn't get you anywhere. It doesn't allow you to deal with life. It doesn't allow you to grow as a person. This is a kind of uh, in-game for intellectuals. Rather, it is the, the refinement and purification of one's midot, of one's um, character traits, the, um, uh, the, the nurturing of love, of charitableness, of kindness, of integrity, that's really what matters in life. And that's what gets, uh, that is that's what true religious achievement is. And that for Shadal is the true meaning of the Torah. The Torah cannot be boiled down to some kind of Aristotelian um, ethic in which intellectual achievement is the best. Rather, the bitterness of life has taught him that this cannot be the case, that rather uh, it is the emotional and ethical refinement and the refinement of a person's actions within uh, the company of his fellow human beings. That is uh, the true achievement of the Torah. So that is sort of uh, very briefly the major building blocks of Shadal's trajectory. Now, I want to turn our attention to a very important book that he wrote. And the reason I say very important is because I'm working on this book uh, right now. I'm actually in the middle of a translation of this of this dialogue. is Vikuach HaChokmat HaKabala. Um, and of course, I'm going to say it's important because every academic says that their work is the most important, right? It's very unlikely that academics are going to turn around and say, hey, the work that I've been spending my last few months or years on is actually fairly trivial and doesn't really mean anything in the grand scheme of things. Um, obviously, every academic has that kind of um, location bias uh, of their own interest. However, I, I want to show that actually this work is very important and crucial for understanding Shadal's overall worldview. So the Vikuach HaChokmat HaKabalah al Kabuta Zohar al Ta'amim Bahan Nikud, this is quite a mouthful. Uh, it translates as the disputation regarding the discipline of the Kabbalah on the antiquity of the Zohar and the cantillation and violation marks. Um, this was written when he was a young man, the age of 26, um, and he put it in a drawer, more or less, for about uh, 25 years. Um, and he circled, he, as a manuscript, he circled it among a few close friends, but basically he updated it only occasionally and sporadically during those 26 years and eventually published it in, well, it says 1952, of course, I should say 1852, um, and, and that's when he published it. Now, why is Shadal's view on Kabbalah and the antiquity of the Kabbalistic tradition so important? So first, it's important to know that Shadal's work belongs in a fairly long line of Kabbalah criticism. Uh, what I mean by this is as follows. Kabbalah, the texts of the Kabbalistic movement, really only surface in the mid to late 13th century in Spain, in Castilla, uh, in Girona, and other locations within, uh, within the Spanish peninsula during the mid to late 13th century. The main work 
of the Kabbalah, the, the, the centerpiece, as would later become, was the Zohar. The Zohar was only produced, was only brought to light in the 1280s and 1290s by a Kabbalist called Moshe de Leon. And ever since that, and, and you know, it was it was essentially a live text, it was, it was circulated as various manuscripts uh, until printing uh, in the 16th century. And what happened was that in the intervening time between then and now, two things happened. First is that the Zohar achieved a kind of canonical status within most of the rabbinical uh, tradition and was seen as, as an authentic work of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, one of the important Tanaim of the first or uh, the first century of the common era. Um, and, and, and so that, that happened as, you know, it achieved a kind of canonical status. However, there's always been a minority voice among um, senior rabbis who have cast doubt upon the uh, antiquity and the authority of the Zohar. In other words, have said not only is the Zohar actually a product of the medieval period, but rather it is a... It, it cannot be relied upon. It isn't a source of authentic, um, well, certainly authentic uh, source of halakha, of law, but also of theology, of philosophy, or authentic source of Jewish outlook. And I've put here a few names, Eliyad del Megiddo, and Leon del Modena, and Yaakov Emden. These are all um, senior rabbinic scholars who wrote themselves critiques of the Zohar and, and essentially tried to show how the Zohar is not to be uh, seen as something reliable. Shadal, from a young age, had actually developed his own criticism of the Zohar from his study of grammar. And how this works is that Shadal's study of the history of the grammar um, led him to the conclusion that's, that's basically embraced by the majority of, I would say, academic scholars nowadays, which is that the imposition of the nikud, of the vowel marks, and the ta'amim and, and cantillation marks, uh, which you see in every chumash, is a very late development, right? And, and basically it is... Um, it is attributed to the Masoretes, to the scholars uh, writing in Tiveria, in I believe the eighth or ninth century, um, and therefore it postdates the Talmud. What is the problem? The problem is the Zohar makes extensive use of these vowel marks, and therefore Shadal, having read the Zohar again from a very young age, and 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 had come to the conclusion that it cannot be that a work from the first century is referencing the vowel signs that only came into existence in the eighth or ninth century, and therefore the Zohar must be a late. Uh, a, a late book. And this is also, again, the, the conclusion of, of, I would say, most, uh, or in fact, the consensus of modern academics in the field. Uh, what is interesting, and this is the crazy story that I alluded to before, is that Shadal was so convinced of this at a young age, and was so convinced that the Kabbalah was a late invention and therefore inauthentic, that he refused um, to follow his father's request on his mother's deathbed. At the age of 14, 1814, his mother was dying. She was on his deathbed. And his father turns to him and says, here, please say this series of tefillah, this series of prayers that I have. And Shadal takes a look at these prayers and realizes they are of Kabbalistic origin. They, they invoke all sorts of Kabbalistic ideas. And Shadal refuses. He says, I know my mother's on his, her deathbed. I know her only chance is, you know, for us to recite these prayers. And I refuse because I don't view Kabbalah as, a, um, as an authentic source of, of Jewish tradition. And this, I mean, this is really quite extraordinary. And he refused. And he said his father was obviously extremely upset with him. But, uh, but he was a, a, a young 14-year-old of principle. And he refused to, to take this on. So... This Vikuach that I'm interested in, about 130 page book, it is a dialogue between a skeptical scholar and a traditionalist author. So you have the first person author narrator, um, speaking of the first person, who is a traditionalist, who says, you know, I, you know, I believe that the Kabbalah is, is authentic, it does go back all the way, we can, um, we can uh, approve its antiquity, and the scholar, a traveling scholar from Poland, who is a skeptic, who basically tries to disprove this, it's a very in-depth, um, and I would say extremely erudite and learned debate invoking Jewish sources from across the canon, and they debate the following questions. The first is the antiquity and the authority of the Zohar. In other words, is the, is the Zohar, can we really say it is a first cent or second century work, um, or do we have to say, no, it's actually a 13th century work because of its ideas, because of its language, because, again, of its reliance on, on the Nikud, on the vowels? The second subject that's debated is, is Kabbalah a coherent and original body of thought, right? Now, this is, again, something that's very much up for debate. In other words, is Kabbalah one system of thought, or is it a, an uneasy and, and disparate and variegated discipline in which there are several major streams of thought which are contradictory and which do not sit well one with another? And also, is it an original body of thought? In other words, can the Kabbalistic, can Jewish mysticism be seen to be original or has it simply taken ideas from other um, from you know medieval philosophy and, and other um, strains of ideas, um, has the Kabbalah been a positive effect? Had a net positive effect on Jewish ideas and practice? This is also a very interesting question, which is discussed at length uh, in the Vikuach, because you know obviously the skeptic is saying you know we once had this pure tradition which taught truth, and suddenly the Kabbalists came and muddled us all, uh, all and and you know introduced all kinds of foreign and um, 
strange concepts into the history of Jewish thought. Um, and finally, and this is also something that's debated and, and very, uh, um, very important, the basis, I would suppose, of the entire Vikuach is who is qualified to speak and discuss about these ideas. The, the host, who is the traditionalist, says, what do you mean? In order to discuss these things, you have to be a Mekubal, a Kabbalist, which means you have to receive the tradition from a qualified expert Kabbalist. And therefore, you and I, says the, the traditionalist author, the host, we can't discuss these things um, because we don't really understand what is written. Whereas the, the guest, the skeptical guest, who is this, you know, this Polish scholar, um, he represents the, the spirit of the Wissenschaft, the Unitum Movement, and he's saying that no, on the contrary, if it is written down in the text, then you and I and anyone who reads this text is qualified to form an opinion what's written in these texts, because at the end of the day, we have to judge ideas on the historical evidence that we have, and the historical evidence is written within the text. These are the major um, questions that are debated. What's fascinating, to me at least, is that these are exactly the questions that are um, that are still, I would say, controversial between the world of academia and the world of um, of the rabbinic uh, and of the yeshiva. So if you would sit, uh, you know, a, a prominent academic or, or even just a student of Jewish studies from the university down with, uh, you know, a rabbinic scholar to discuss the Zohar, these are exactly the questions that they will disagree upon, right? The the um, the, the rabbinic scholar, the, the, sort of the yeshiva student would likely take the position of the traditionalist author, whereas the academic would likely take the position of the skeptical scholar who says, no, Kabbalah is a very late invention. It is a foreign interloper, an intrusion, um, um, a non-indigenous element within Jewish thought, and therefore uh, should not be given the kind of credence and authenticity and authority that has been granted to it throughout history. Um, the major strengths of dialogue, and this is, this is why I love it. The first is, and this is, this is something extraordinary, this is very rare to see, that this dialogue is a balanced dialogue, okay? Most of the time, both within Jewish thought and you know, looking at uh, the history of dialogues generally, you most often see that, that the dialogue is not balanced. You have one expert. So for example, let's say you take the Platonic dialogues, right? Socrates um, is, so Socrates is clearly the good guy, so to speak. He's clearly the person who is the fountain of wisdom, the fountain of, of the correct uh, method of Socratic dialogue and of, of um, sort of critical thinking. And his interlocutor are, are clearly those who um, you know, are not as well versed, not as philosophically uh, as sophisticated. And therefore, there's a clear good guy and a clear bad guy in the dialogue. Um, and, and that's how most dialogues are. It's the same in the Kuzari, right? The Rabbi Huda Halevi's canonical dialogue, dialogical work from the 12th century. So, um, so again, you have the Chacham, the, 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 the main prota uh, protagonist of the book, and you have the king who is learning from him. Whereas here, the Vikuach is extraordinary. It is a balanced dialogue. In other words, both sides give very strong and convincing cases for, or, or, or rather, um, you defend their case uh, very strongly and with great conviction uh, and with great learning as well. And interestingly, although Shadal's sympathies are with the skeptical guest, he gives the traditionalist a very strong uh, case to be made as well. And in fact, I would say that Shadal's own sympathies are distributed evenly among the protagonists, right? There is no mouthpiece of the author. The author's brain is split because Shadal himself was a very conservative, a small C conservative kind of thinker. And therefore, he was also very skeptical of the methodological advances of many of the other Wissenschaft Unitum scholars. And therefore, there is a lot of Shadal even in the host, even in the traditionalist who's rejecting uh, uh, the guest, whereas there's obviously also a lot of Shadal in the guest because Shadal himself rejects Kabbalah um, as such. It is also uh, interesting that, that it's, it's really a literary gem. It's you know very uh, uh, rich lyrical Hebrew. There are a lot of wonderful insults. I love this work as well because there are dozens and dozens of very harsh insults. I have no idea why Shadal saw fit to do this, but the, the debate is very acrimonious. Neither side liked the other one very much, um, and there's a lot of, of, uh, sort of insult and repartee and, and very um, you know hostile atmosphere throughout. Um, and it also, and this is the point that the, really the point I want to make and to, to bring this book to your attention is it exemplifies Shadal as representing a middle path, a middle tradition within Jewish thought. Uh, if you look at, for example, medieval Jewish thought, on the one hand, you have um, the uh, the rationalists, the Maimonidean rationalists on, on one side, and the other side, you have, let's say, the Kabbalists, um, represented by the Zohar and, and, its, uh, and the various authors within that circle. And then in the middle, you have uh, the school that's best exemplified by Rabbi Huda Halevi, again, a 12th century um, philosopher and poet, who, who represents a, a rejection of both parts, a very strong um, a, a very strong critique that's leveled against both philosophy and rationalism. And, and for Shadal, this is because the Torah is, number one, ethically oriented. Number two, it is this worldly. But number three, and this is the most important part, for Shadal, the Torah is exoteric. 
if there's one thing that I would like everyone to take away from this class, it is that Shadal saw the Torah as exoteric. What do I mean by that? The Torah, the, the text of the, of the Bible that we have, doesn't point to anything else. It doesn't, it isn't some kind of cover for deeper secrets or deeper ideas that, that that's the real meat of the Torah and the text is just the, the covering. No, for Shadal, what you see is the main message of the Torah and that message is to lead you to live an ethical uh, and um, you know, a, a life of refined characteristic traits. Uh, whereas, again, if you would ask a rationalist, so the Torah is, you know, a nice uh, a work of, of law and narrative, but it's really covering the deep theological truths, which is the real thing that, are, uh, which is the real apex of religious achievements. And the same with the Kabbalists. The Kabbalists believe the Torah is, again, you know, certainly a divine document, certainly very important, but it is a cover, a garb, a cloak for the deep mystical secrets, which, which again, represent the true apex of religious achievement. Shadal, both ways are nonsense. And this Vikuach is meant to show both. It's meant to, it, it very much uh, excoriates and, and rejects both philosophical rationalism and Kabbalah, precisely because it, um, it sees the Torah as exoteric and ethically oriented. Okay, the final uh, point that I want to make in this, uh, in this lecture, then we'll open for questions, is Shadal the Hebraist. Um, and that is because Shadal was a very important contributor to the 19th century Renaissance, the efflorescence of the Hebrew language. Once again, for many, many centuries, um, millennia even, Hebrew was really just a, a language that was used in, um, in, in sort of sacramental circumstances. It was the language of prayer, it was the language of learning. Um, however, the 19th century became a, a language that was fit for all sorts of purposes, a language of scholarship, a language of books, of fairy tales, of, of secular songs, of political philosophy, of, of everything. This was really something that the, the 19th century, uh, you know, very much uh, strongly oversaw, oh, sorry, strongly oversaw. Um, uh, and Shadal contributed to this because he was a prolific Hebrew writer and grammarian and poet. And he believed that the true Jewish scholarship really needed a technical understanding of the Hebrew language. There is no um, way to carry out a serious, we'll see this next week, a serious commentary on the Bible or any other layer of Jewish text or Jewish history without having a mastery of the technicalities necessary for the Hebrew language. Um, and finally, Shadal, and this has been recognized by subsequent um, um, academics, that Shadal has a very significant place in the 19th century resurrection of the Hebrew language. You have, you know, the heroic uh, figures such as Eliezer ben Yehuda, who writes, uh, or rather compiles the first Hebrew dictionary. You have the great uh, poets of Chaim Nachman Bialik and the great writers of, of, of Chernichovsky and the great essayist, uh, essayist Achat Ha'am, but Shadal, due to his scholarship, his poetry, his books on grammar, his, his various, um, his you know, voluminous output of Hebrew, he uh, has a very important place in the 19th century resurrection of the Hebrew language. And finally, I want to end off with a very funny piece, which is uh, a, a, um, a polemic example to this, Shadal's sarcastic response to Rav Hirsch. So Rav Shimshu Rafael Hirsch was obviously one of the, the senior rabbis in Germany of his generation, and he writes a letter to Shadal, because again, it was the Republic of Letters, they were all sending various letters to each other, and Hirsch um, writes to Shadal in German, now, of course, this is to be expected. German was um, Hirsch's native language. And also Shadal had a beautiful German. He wrote in German, he read German, no problem with it. However, he was very annoyed that, that, uh, that Hirsch, who was a senior rabbi, was sending him, Shadal, a senior scholar, a letter in German. This is, this is the little ditty, the little poem that he composed, uh, which I'll read out and explain. He, he wrote back to him a normal letter, and at the bottom he put this following verse. So I'll, I'll translate and explain. Uh, uh, Igrot Tzafon was the uh, Hebrew title of, uh, of Hirsch's earliest work, of 19 Briefe, his 19 letters on, on Judaism. And so, so Igrot Tzafon. What was he thinking, the author of Igrot Tzafon, i.e. Hirsch, has he turned into a Geiger or a Holtheim? These are two um, senior reform rabbis. Words, what was he thinking, Rev. Uh, uh, you Have you turned into Geiger? Have you become a reform rabbi? That you're writing to Shadal in the language of the north, of the northern barbaric tribes, of the Germans, right? And not in the language of Judah and Jerusalem? As he's say, saying to Hirsch, what, you're writing to me in German? Have you become some kind of reformist? Do you not realize that it's not worthy of a senior rabbinic fellow such as yourself to write in any other language apart from Sfat Yehudavi Yerushalayim, the language of Judah and Jerusalem. So this is an excellent example of Shadal's polemical approach 
and um, also, also his polemical barb that he threw uh, at Hirsch when uh, the latter wrote to him in German. And, uh, and again, this ends off uh, the presentation, Shadal as the Hebraist, Shadal as the traditionalist, the one who represents a middle path between uh, rationalism, or rather a rejection of ration, philosophical rationalism, a rejection of Kabbalah and mysticism, and really a, an exponent of a kind of middle path that focused on ethical, uh, on ethical excellence and an exoteric surface level reading of, uh, of the Torah and the Jewish text. And with that, I'm going to stop the share and end that and open for questions. Wow, that was amazing. Thank you so much. And um, now pause for breath. Yes. And uh, if anyone has any questions, they can raise your hand and uh, we'll, we'll uh, take we'll take them. Got a question here in the in person Kabaraha. Go for it. Yes. Thank you so much for, for, for this uh, wonderful summary. Um, hey. What was, in your opinion, the Shadow's view on the sort of nascent Hasidic movement? Uh, out of the more eastern part of Europe, did, did he have any interaction with, with that movement, and, and what was his perception of it? Um, Hasidism doesn't feature tremendously in Shadal's writings. Um, as a, he did belong very much to the center and west, whereas Hasidism really encroached primarily in the east, in Poland, uh, in Lithuania, in Ukraine, etc. Having said that, he brought out the Vikuach uh, Kabbalah in 1852 because he heard of the excesses of the Hasidim. He writes at the end of his thing, he said, listen, I had this manuscript, this anti-Kabbalistic manuscript. It sat in my drawer for a quarter of a century, but I was persuaded by a friend that I met at a wedding that it was necessary to produce such a book because the, uh, the Hasidim were, had, had all these sort of, um, in his view, crazy excesses of, of, uh, of perhaps um, artificial religiosity based on uh, based on the words of, of, of the Kabbalistic text, and therefore he sought to knock Kabbalah down a peg or two. Um, but, but aside from that, there isn't a huge amount addressed, uh, because again, geographically, he was on the periphery. Uh, Simon. Yeah, uh, something I've noticed um, among people who have spent any time reading Shadal is that they develop a, a great personal affection to him. I, I saw it in myself, I, I see it in you, and recently I've seen that there's a Facebook group called To Know Shadal is to Love Him. Yes. So what do you think it is about Shadal that inspires this, this personal attraction? Um, there, there are a few factors involved. Um, I, I, I can actually attest to that as well. Uh, it's something I didn't really want to mention because I said I wanted to sort of address it as academically as possible. But it is certainly true that those who get into Shadal tend to um, be enchanted by him. Um, firstly, for those who, who are competent enough to read the Hebrew, the, it's very beautiful language. It really is a kind of rich lyrical language which um, seduces the reader to a large degree. He also is a very, he talks a lot about his own personal life, his own personal journey. Um, and you really, it, it's, there isn't this kind of distance that with Germanic scholars, uh, they like to like to have that. In fact, um, one of the Wissenschaft uh, classic scholars bragged that he never used the word I in any of his writings, because that's obviously an affront to academic um, uh, norms, whereas, um, or, whereas for sure, you know, constantly talking about himself. Um, and also I think this, this ratification of this middle way, this notion that actually the Torah is to be understood exoterically, and you don't need to be some sort of Aristotelian expert or some kind of Kabbalist in order to, to make the most, in order to, to, to really achieve the peak of spirituality. Rather, you need to do the very basics that is demanded from you, um, you know, uh, um, by the halakhic system, and also just to keep the Torah as it is. The notion that Judaism is what it says on the tin. Uh, essentially. I think that's something that, that is quite seductive. People like that. People uh, uh, prefer to do that. The final part of the answer I would say is wait for next week, because next week we're going to look at Shadal's um, Torah commentary, and you'll see the various elements that I think uh, drew people into that, into that as well. And my, I have a question, which is, who, wh where did uh, Shadal learn, and uh, who did he study under? Um, so he, he um, that's a good question. Until the age of 13, he was put in a school that taught him a lot of secular studies that, that you know, um, an awful lot of, um, as you say, he was exposed to, to various languages, to, to various other philosophers. Um, then he 
after his bar mitzvah, essentially, or rather after his mother's death, he started learning with um, Rabbi Abraham Eliezer Halevi, I think that, that's his name, um, and a fairly a prominent Italian authority. Um, this Rav Halevi offered to give Shadal Smicha at some point, Shadal turned him down, um, but he, he, he was with him for a few years until they did have a, a rupture of some sort. Um, and, uh, you know, Shadal's personality was quite abrasive in many ways. He He didn't tend to... Uh, even his friends, he sort of wrote quite harsh things about. Um, and therefore, they, they did have a kind of rapture, although Shadal wrote a very glowing obituary for this Rav Halevi. So, um, so yeah, that, that was where he, he learned most of his Torah. Shadal was also a tremendous autodidact. A lot of what he learned, he taught himself. Um, and he clearly, you know, but had an ethos of self-mastery of various elements of the Jewish canon, I would say, uh, which superseded almost anyone else of his generation. He, he really was so, you know, Located so much on a periphery, and yet managed to master a massive uh, uh, amount of of the Hebrew canon. So you know, that, that's, I think, one of his most enduring achievements. Thank you. Anyone else? Any other questions? I think there's another one at the Chabura. Sorry to hijack the question. Any links between the, the Ramchal and, and the Shadal? Because the, the, the sort of uh, dialogue reminds me of it, the playwriting that the Ramchal. Right. Okay, um, I'm sort of happy and unhappy you've asked this question because it's something that I did once try and and uh, dig into, um, and it's, it's difficult. To find. I would say the following: I did once see a Lutzato family tree. I don't forget uh, Ramchal died, I believe, in 1745. So it was already 65 years prior to Shadal. Um, Shadal, I, 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 they are distantly related. That's the answer. They are distantly related. I'm not sure exactly, I can't remember exactly how close or how distant. Um, it's also interesting that Shadal doesn't talk an awful lot about Ramchal. He does mention one or two of his, uh, I think one of his plays or some, some of his other stuff. Um, it's interesting that there isn't a huge amount of interaction from what I see uh, in Shadal. Again, I showed you how, how much of Shadal's works there are, and so therefore I can't claim to have read all of it. I can't, you know, it's possible there are the pockets where he does have strong interaction with the Ramchal. Um, but they were both very impressive figures in that if you actually look at Ramchal's writings, um, as you say, enormous amount of, of, of a wide variety of literary endeavors, plays, poetries, other kinds of polemical works, etc. There, there are a few of his works which are very famous and have been, you know, uh, reproduced and translated. The Misilat Yesharim, the Derech Hashem, but a lot of his works um, have actually been lost to us because they were burnt. Um, and also, we, you know, a lot of his stuff has hardly been read because it's just in manuscript form, and very few people are interested in reading the plays of the Ramchal. I will say the following: It is difficult for me to judge, and of course, I'm not trying to sort of pass full judgment on them. In my opinion, I think Shadal's achievements are somewhat more impressive than Ramchal. Now, I'll, I'll tell you why I think that, right? Ramchal was a brilliant man, obviously, but, but a Kabbalist. You know, he was very uh, important player within the Kabbalistic system and borrowed very heavily from Kabbalistic ideas and nomenclature. And the thing is that if you do that, if you, if you buy into the Kabbalistic system, then tremendous creativity is not actually that hard to come by, right? You have this whole treasure trove of symbols, of ideas, of, of tropes, which you can then use in your own uh, writings, which, which, you know, is very impressive and very uh, rich. But if, but, but, and of course, Ramchal used them, whereas Shadal simply shut the lids of that treasure trope. He didn't use that at all. He wasn't interested in it. And, um, and therefore it makes his works much more impressive. You know, I'll just give sort of a kind of an example, which is that let's, if you're a Kabbalist, let's say, and you're faced with the question, you know, a very basic question from Genesis chapter one. Why were there seven days of creation? Why couldn't God just create everything in one uh, in one go, right? So this is a very different question to the Kabbalist and to the um, and to the non to, to the to the Shadal who represents the middle way, to the anti-Kabbalist, right? The Kabbalist can simply say something along the lines of, well, and this is, you know, rich in, in Kabbalistic thought, but the se seven days of creation represent or correspond to the, the, the bottom seven of the Sfirot. There are 10, there are SS Sfirot, right? And there's a division between the top three, which are known as, as, um, as Arich and Pin, the, the sort of the longer side, ironically, and the bottom seven, which are Chesed, Gvura, Tiferet, Neta, Chod, Yesod, and Malchut. And those are the seven, which are known as, as, um, as the Eran Pin, which... And the Kabbalists often relate those to the seven days of creation. Of course, the seven, the final one is Malchut, which is the Shekhinah, which is Shabbat, and which is, you know, um, the day of, of Vayin Nafash, where God sort of exhaled and there's this creation from the final sphere of all the various uh, worlds, including the physical world. And you, and that's a very rich 
trove in which you can dig in. If you're a Kabbalist, that's a very satisfying way of saying that's why there needs to be a seven stage form of creation because it, it corresponds to the sort of seven stage emanation of the spheroids, which eventually um, which eventually gave us the physical and spiritual worlds in which we live. If you're if you're Shadal, all this is closed to you. You can't can't really rely on any of this, right? Um, and therefore, you have to come up with your own forms of creativity, which uh, which are very different and and require a, a different kind of creativity. And that's why Shadal has more of my admiration in that sense because he managed to create so much, uh, such a rich body of Jewish works, which didn't rely either on the Kabbalistic works, nor on the rationalist works of the Rambam and his school. So that, that's uh, on one leg, uh, my, my answer to, uh, a long answer to a short question. For those interested in starting to learn some of Shadal, uh, so what's a, what's a first good uh, work to start? So obviously I would say that you'll have to wait till sometime next year when my translation and commentary on the Vikuach comes out will be available in none of the good bookstores in India. Don't, cover, don't uh, take this kind of academic works. Uh, but published by the Chabura, right? Sorry? Published by the Chabura. Yeah, I, no, I wish, well, perhaps a future uh, uh, Shadal translation. Now, this one will be, I think, Paul Greg Macmillan or whoever, um, but, uh, but available in, you know, uh, to other ones. Uh, right now, I would say probably Shadal's commentary on the Torah. Now, if you can get hold of it, it's not so hard. There have been a few uh, elements of it translated. And there you have um, um, good nuggets of Shadal, sort of digestible nuggets of Shadal's ideas and his polemics against the Rambo and, and his other. And you see his, his, his creativity and his pshat oriented, exoteric um, um, way of looking at the Torah. So that's probably the best place to start. Um, yes, yeah, I, I think I, that's, uh, that's a good place to start. Okay, any last uh, questions, comments before we close for the night? I had one question, if that's okay. Uh, that was amazing, so thank you. Um, thank you. Zohar in his sefer on um, some Sephardi Teshubot around the world, he, he always says that it, he often writes that the Italian jury, the intellectual culture of it, Italian jury was the closest thing to Andalusian jury. Mm -hmm. So my question was, what are the hachamim of that time um, would you are you aware of or that we can know about the names of those hachamim who kind of of that ilk if you like uh of uh i can only think of hacham ben amozet uh, uh, the other big name of late 19th century italian jury is uh is ben amozet who was the rabbi of livorno uh passed away in the year 1900 um and and he he was of that the problem with ben amozet is that he really is an outlier if you think shadow is an outlier but ben amozet his uh worldview is even more far out, which is why he was the thing with Shadan Ben Amazeg as well is that they've somewhat fallen through the cracks, right? Um, you know, between the yeshiva world and the Sephardic world, and they they sort of escaped attention to a large degree. This is coming back now, by the way, the last 10, 20 years, a renewed interest in Shadan Ben Amazeg. Um, but he's a very important uh, figure. The other two that I mentioned, especially Yitzhak Shmuel Regio, Yashar of Goritzia, uh, he was also an important figure. He started the school in Paduan, he, he produced a bunch of his own works. Um, I'll have to think of others, but in terms of 19th century Italian jury, um, those are, I think, your best bets. Um, having said that, this is an important thing, I think this is a good place to end, which is that one must never forget how creative tensions tend to produce brilliant solutions, right? Why was it that, um, that in Germany was such a, a sort of epicenter of uh, a brilliant Jewish ideas? One of the reasons is because there was this tremendous tension between uh, the the spirit of the enlightenment and the spirit of the new uh, um, sort of Germanic states in the uh, mid to late 19th century. And that posed a tremendous challenge to Jewish thinkers. Jewish thinkers responded with, with Wissenschaft, with, um, with reform, with orthodoxy, with all these various new uh, forms, precisely because they were in this kind of pressure cooker. Italian and English Jewry didn't really have so much of that pressure cooker. They're, those, the, the kinds of buffeting winds of reform Judaism and orthodox Judaism, they, they didn't produce, in Italy, you have still one or two, you still have uh, Shadam, but I was like, in England, you have very little intellectual exercise in the 19th century. However, in Central Europe, and to a certain degree in Galicia and parts of Eastern Europe, you have a tremendous efflorescence of um, this kind of religious creativity precisely because of the adverse conditions that there were um, uh, in Prussia, in Germany, in, um, in that, that area of the world. So um, it's, it's sort of, Italy in that way was a victim of its own success, and England as well, um, to, to a certain degree, I would say. Wow. Chacham, thank you so much. And uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining yeah. us. Wonderful. I'm looking forward to next week. See you all. Have a good night, everyone.
All the best.